God, I thank you so much for who you are. God, you are Father, Son, and Spirit. It brings you great delight to call us your daughters. So God, right now I ask if there's anyone in this room who does not yet know you as Father, Son, and Spirit, don't let them leave here without saying yes to your invitation of life and of love. God, would they come to know you tonight? And for everybody else in this space who may already know you, but I don't know what they brought into this room. I don't know what's been weighing on their hearts, what's been distracting them, but I pray that even in this moment that I'm praying, Holy Spirit, will you just bring freedom, peace, clarity, and hope, and a hunger for so much more of you. God, I believe in the word that you have led us to today. And I'm so expectant to see what you're gonna do in and through it. So this time is yours and so are we. Have your way among us for your glory and our good. All right. Well, every month here at Woven, we are going to be digging into a woman of the Bible. We're gonna be learning her story And we're going to spend the whole month in that story. And so you'll see on your table you have bookmarks with six questions. We work through those six questions in thread groups. And I encourage you to take one with you because my hope is that where we are in the scriptures today, which by the way is going to be in 2 Kings chapter 4, it's probably not very popular, but it's really good. So my hope is that you're going to stick this right in 2 Kings chapter 4 and come back and come back and come back. And sit in this story with the Lord, sit in this story with one another, and see what the Holy Spirit, who leads us into all truth, reveals to you through this woman's story. So I knew we had to kick off Woven with the Samaritan woman in John 4. She was the poster child for Woven. But as soon as we could get to this woman's story in 2 Kings 4, I wanted to. Likely, It's not familiar to you. Her story is not widely known or shared, but I believe that it should be. And it's my joy to share it with you tonight. She's known as the Shunammite woman. She's not assigned a name in the scriptures, much like the Samaritan woman of last month. And yet, she is named before God. God knows her name. He sees her. He hears her. He has great plans for her in the same way he does for you. Know that the Lord our God sees you. He hears you. He cares for you and has great plans for you. My prayer each month as we learn these stories of women in the Bible is that we better understand God's story in our own and one another's and how we can live into God's story better together, empowered by his spirit as his daughters. I pray these stories encourage you as they've encouraged me. So the Shunammite woman, she's a woman from Shunamm, and tonight we're going to be reading from the New Living Translation. It's a different translation than what I read from last month. We may be reading a different English translation every time we gather. The reason for that is that I'm looking to see which translation does the best job of telling this particular woman's story. All the translations are honorable and accurate, but I try to find the best one for our time together. I think the New Living Translation does a really good job sharing this story. But you're also going to hear me comment on some of the original Hebrew that might be missing here. So you have an option. You can turn to 2 Kings 4 with me or I give you permission to enjoy story time. Because the majority of the Bible was originally intended to be heard in the context of community. And we often miss that. So you're free to enjoy story time if you would like tonight. So here we go. I will tell you two things before we get started. First, um, I want you to look for, there's a couple of main characters here, the Shunammite woman, and a man named Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha with an S-H. Elisha is a man of God, he's a prophet, and in this culture, at this time, in this day, prophets represented God to the people. And so I want you to look as we hear the story, or listen, for how the Shunammite woman's posture towards Elisha, the man of God, shifts and takes new shapes and forms throughout the course of the story. When you look at the way that she relates to Elisha, consider how she relates to God. It's what it's representing 
in the story. All right. One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets, oh, you see, I messed up. I'm starting in verse one because I didn't tell you what verse we're starting in. We're starting in verse eight. (laughs) Um, So verse eight, start over. One day, another one day. That Hebrew word is Y-O-M, yom, and it's all over the Bible. So one day, Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day, Elisha returned to Shunem, and he went up to this upper room to rest. He said to his servant Gehazi, Tell the woman from Shunem, I want to speak to her. When she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her, we appreciate the kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied. My family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son and her husband is an old man. Call her back again, Elisha told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her as she stood in the doorway, next year at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she cried. Oh man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. Once her child was older, he went out to help his father, who was working with the harvesters. Suddenly he cried out, my head hurts, my head hurts. His father said to one of the servants, carry him home to his mother. So the servant took him home, and his mother held him on her lap. But around noontime, he died. She carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and left him there. She sent a message to her husband. Send one of the servants and a donkey so that I can hurry to the man of God and come right back. Why go today, he asked. It's neither a new moon festival nor a Sabbath. But she said, it will be all right. So she saddled the donkey and said to the servant, hurry, don't slow down unless I tell you to. As she approached the man of God at Mount Carmel, Elisha saw her in the distance. He said to Gehazi, Look, the woman from Shunem is coming. Run out to meet her and ask her, is everything all right with you, your husband, and your child? Yes, the woman told Gehazi. Everything is fine. But when she came to the man of God at the mountain, she fell to the ground before him and caught hold of his feet. Gehazi began to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She is deeply troubled, but the Lord has not told me what it is. Then she said, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? And didn't I say, don't deceive me and get my hopes up? Then Elisha said to Gehazi, get ready to travel. Take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. But the boy's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I won't go home unless you go with me. So Elisha returned with her. Gehazi hurried on ahead and laid the staff on the child's face, but nothing happened. There was no sign of life. He returned to meet Elisha and told him, the child is still dead. When Elisha arrived, the child was indeed dead, lying there on the prophet's bed. He went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Then he lay down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, and his hands on the child's hands. And as he stretched out on him, the child's body began to grow warm again. 
Elisha got up, walked back and forth across the room once, and then stretched himself out again on the child. This time, the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Then Elisha summoned Gehazi, called the child's mother, he said. And when she came in, Elisha said, here, take your son. She fell at his feet and bowed before him, overwhelmed with gratitude. Then she took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. Now she shows up in a few chapters, in 2 Kings chapter 8, the first six verses. Let's see what happens. Elisha had told the woman, whose son he had brought back to life, take your family and move to some other place. For the Lord has called for a famine on Israel that will last for seven years. So the woman did as the man of God instructed. She took her family and settled in the land of the Philistines for seven years. After the famine ended, she returned from the land of the Philistines, and she went to see the king about getting back her house and land. As she came in, the king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. The king had just said, tell me some stories about the great things Elisha has done. And Gehazi was telling the king about the time when Elisha had brought a boy back to life. At that very moment, the mother of the boy walked in to make her appeal to the king about her house and land. Look, my lord, the king, Gehazi exclaimed. Here is the woman now, and this is her son, the very one Elisha brought back to life. Is this true, the king asked her, and she told him the story. So he directed one of his officials to see that everything she had lost was restored to her, including the value of any crops that had been harvested during her absence. Now, I know that's a big story. I don't know how often you've heard it, but it's powerful. Did you see how her posture changed towards this man of God throughout the journey of the story? In the beginning, she's hospitable, but she's passive. This man who passes by continually is what Hebrew says. She invites him in. She makes a place for him to stay on her roof so that whenever he comes to us, he has somewhere to stay. But then what happens? He asks, what can we do for you? And she says, I live among my own people. My family takes good care of me. She's independent and she should be. She's a prominent woman, but she is not relying on what he is offering her. And so they think to themselves, what can we do for this woman? Well, she doesn't have a son and her husband is old. Now here's what's interesting. That Hebrew word is the word for son. It's not the word for barren, which is used often in the Old Testament to describe women who are without children and unable to have children. That's not what the scriptures say. It doesn't say that she is without children and unable to have children. It says she doesn't have a son. Now in this culture, in this time, the most important thing for her was to have a son, to pass on the lineage and the inheritance and the legacy of her family. So my prayer as we're inwoven is that as we learn these stories and you sit in them, scripture is no longer a plaque on the wall to be admired from a distance, but it is the very word of God given us to show us who he is and how we can walk with him. My prayer is that you step into this story, that you see what's in black and white and you step in and you explore and it comes to life for you by the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. So as we're in that story, I just wonder... She doesn't have a son. Elisha promises that this time next year, you'll embrace the son. You'll hold a boy in your arms. And she says, what? No. The NLT actually gets a little wordy here. In the Hebrew, she says, no, my Lord, Adonai. No, my Lord, do not deceive me. Ultimately, do not be a liar or make yourself out to be a liar. Why would she respond to what should be the greatest gift and promise she could receive like that? I believe she has experienced pain and loss. I believe she's speaking out of hurt and sorrow and grief and suffering as she's built this wall around her heart. And she receives the greatest promise. She doesn't want it, she rebukes it. No, my Lord, do not deceive me. So she could have daughters, we don't know. And this is total speculation, so don't take this as gospel truth. But know that you can step in the story and figure out what's going on here. And I think, just me, 
I'm not telling you you have to think this. I think she did have a son at some point and she lost him. We wouldn't know when, doesn't tell us. But why on earth would she respond this way to that promise? So it continues. She does end up a year later having a son, whether she wanted that son or not. (laughs) And the son grows up to go work with his dad in the fields, and we don't know how old the son is. I would imagine he's no younger than seven to be able to go out and work in the harvest fields with his dad and the harvesters. So it's been at minimum probably eight years since Elisha made that promise, and she said, no, don't deceive me. And so Elisha goes out the fields, um, not Elisha, sorry, her son, and his head hurts. And his dad sends him to his mom. He sits in her lap and he dies in her arms. And what does she do? You see, I'm not a mom, but if my son died in my arms, I don't think I would ever want to let him go. But what does she do? She picks him up. She lifts him up and carries him and lays him on the bed she had made for the man of God on her roof, which I believe is a space of prayer and offering. It's out of her hands. She closes the door and heads out. She asks her husband for a donkey and a servant to run to the man of God. That's what the Hebrew says, that she would run to the man of God. This woman who just, you know, whenever he comes to us, no, now she's running to the man of God. You notice she doesn't even tell her husband that her son died. Their son died. So her husband has a fair response. He says, why would you go to the man of God? It's not even a religious day. And she says in the Hebrew, it will be well. Okay, it will be well. She saddles the donkey, says, servant, let's go. Hurry up. Don't slow down unless I tell you to. When she arrives, Elisha sees her at a distance He sends Gehazi to ask her, how is it? You know, how are you, your husband, your son? What does she say? In the Hebrew, she says, it is well. Now, before she was going to the man of God, running to the man of God, she said, it will be well. And now she says, it is well. And one of my thread group leaders on Sunday helped me realize something about this story. She said, this woman redefines what it means to say it is well. Because she says it is well when her son is still dead. But she is in the presence of the man of God. Remember who represents God. It is well. And be encouraged. This part of the story reminds me of the story of the prodigal son that Jesus told. Jesus loves stories. And there's a son who the father loved, but he runs off. He spends all his inheritance, but he comes back. And the father sees him while he's still a long way off. And the father runs to meet him. So be encouraged that though Elisha represents God, he is not God. And we have a God, a father God, who loves us so much. He sent his own son, Jesus, to live with us, among us. Suffer and die for us and be raised to life for us so that we might live with him forever, united with him. He doesn't send a servant to come and meet us. He comes to meet us right where we are. That's good news. So she reaches Elisha. She falls on the ground, catches hold of his feet. And Gehazi, the servant, tries to push her away. But Elisha says, let her go. Her soul's deeply troubled. I had a Bible teacher one time who said, the voice of God is always one that draws us near, not one that casts us aside. Do you see it here? Gehazi tries to push her away. Elisha says, let her go. She is wanted before him. She can pour out her soul before him and know that you can too. God wants all of you. Your hurt, your anger, your questions, your frustrations, your sorrow, your sadness, and your joy. He wants it all. So she does that. She says, did I ask for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will not leave without you. You know, the posture she takes here reminds me of the posture of Jacob. When he wrestles with God and he receives the name Israel, he won't let go until he receives a blessing. Do you see this woman is doing the same thing? And yet so many of us have never heard her story. So Elisha gets up and he goes with her. The Hebrew would say she actually, he actually follows behind, which following in the kingdom of God is not following behind at a distance, but it's walking with, together. That is the following that Jesus invites us to. When he says, come follow me, he invites us to walk with him, together. 
So Elisha gets up, walks with her, sees the boy dead on the bed. But what does he do? He prays to the Lord, to Yahweh, to distinguish for us, Elisha is not God, though he represents him. It is not Elisha who restores the dead son to life. It is God. So the boy comes to life. And what does Elisha say to the mom? Take up your son. Take up your son. Now this is weird because when Jesus brings dead people to life in the New Testament, he never says this. They can get up, walk around, talk, eat, all on their own. They're healed. You might hear that language and think, pick up your mat and walk, but that was not a dead man. That was a paralytic, and if anything, it supports what I'm saying. He was healed. He could walk himself. Why does Elisha say to this woman when he restores her dead son to life, which is actually God doing it, take up your son you know, that Hebrew word for take up is nasa. I remembered it in seminary because it's spelled like nasa, lift off, take off, okay? <laughs> take up. This is the exact same word used for what the woman does when she takes up her son, her dead son, and she lays him. She sets him on the bed she's made for the man of God. In this place of prayer and offering, she lifts up, she takes up her son and leaves him in the hands of God. And now that he's come back to life, Elisha says, woman, take up your son. What she has offered, she receives. If that's not restoration, I don't know what is. But what does she do? Before she takes up her son, she falls to the ground, falls at his feet, bows to the ground. Then she takes up her son and goes. Well, that posture in the Old Testament, it's worship. It's worship. The NLT helps us to see she's expressing gratitude. She worships. Do you see how this woman's posture towards God has shifted over the course of the story? Do you hear her faith and her belief and her conviction when she says, it will be well, it is well. And now she's worshiping. Her suffering was never for nothing. Not only did she receive a son, she received so much more than that. She received the opportunity to worship to pour out her heart, to express gratitude, to find the real source of life. This woman who was prominent and could care for herself has fallen into the care of God. There's no greater gift than that. But if that's not enough, she shows back up. We don't know how much time has passed before Elisha says, get up and go with your family. Sojourn wherever you can. The Lord's calling for a seven-year famine here in Israel. So she goes, but she comes back. She's got to appeal to the king for her land and her house because she's been gone in another country for seven years. And just at that time, Elisha's servant Gehazi just happens to be talking about the great things Elisha has done. And just at that time when Gehazi's telling about when Elisha restored a dead son to life, the woman shows up with her son. What? And the king says, what is this true? And what does she do? She tells him her story. Do you remember in the beginning, Elisha and Gehazi are like, what can we do for you? Can we put in a good word for you with the king? And now what? And she's, she's talking to the king herself. She's telling him her own story. And we're about split for table talks. And we only have one question tonight, which is how do you see your story and her story, this woman's story, this Shunammite woman's story, but before we do that, I just want to hope that you see a theme that's developing that I didn't plan on, but God did. Last month, the Samaritan woman, many believed in Jesus because of her word, because of her story. And now this month, the king says, is it true? And she tells him her story. And he says, let all she has lost be restored to her. Do you see the value of these women's stories, of her voice, even within this story of scripture. Don't you believe that God gave us these stories for a reason? So as we share together, I pray that you hear the value of your own voice, of your own story, surely marked by your own pain and suffering and loss. I'm certain there's several women in this room who've experienced miscarriage. We never talk about that here in the church, hardly. It's real suffering. I think this woman understands your story. 
and I know that God does. So go ahead and talk amongst your tables, and then we'll wrap up. You've got about 10 minutes. How do you see your story and her story?